Hello, my name is Brad Tito. I'm Program Manager for Communities and Local Government at the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA. On behalf of Governor Cuomo, welcome. This is the LED Street Lighting Academy, and this is part two of a four-part webinar series presented by NYSERDA's Clean Energy Communities Program and the Lighting Research Center of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, the world's leading center for lighting research and education. Now, the purpose of the Academy is to focus on street lighting technology and lighting design to prepare municipal decision makers for interacting with contractors and the public. This webinar is called Talking Tech, How LED Street Lighting Lights Compare. You'll hear an overview of LED street lighting technology, systems, and products. The goal of today's webinar is to assist municipal decision makers to critically analyze LED products under consideration and select the best products to meet your project goals and objectives. Now, con converting streetlights to energy efficient LED technology helping communities across New York to save taxpayer dollars, provide better lighting, reduce energy use, and improve the environment. And to date, 100 cities, towns, and villages across New York have converted approximately 288,000 streetlights to LED through NYSERDA's Clean Energy Communities Program. So if you are considering a conversion project, chances are there's a community like yours that's already saving money having converted to LED. Now, for more information, including video and slides from this and the other webinars in the series, please visit NYSERDA's LED Street Lighting Toolkit at www.nyserda.ny.gov slash CEC. You will also find an interactive map where you can locate nearby communities that have already converted to LED. Clean Energy Communities also provides regional coordinators to help you as you consider next steps. And you can access all these tools and resources by visiting www.nyserta.ny.gov slash CEC. We're extremely proud to introduce Dan Faring of LRC to kick off Talking Tech, part two of the LED Street Lighting Academy. But before I hand it over to Dan, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box in the webinar we will have time to take a few questions at the end of this call. The webinar is being recorded. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, Brad. Uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm here with Dr. John Bullough, uh, who is our Director of Transportation and Safety Lighting. Um, so he and I are going to run through the presentation today. Um, first. Uh, just some introductions for those of you who were not on the call, uh, the first uh, webinar that we held last month. Just a little bit about the LRC. Uh, as Brad said, we are part of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which is here in Troy, New York. Uh, we have a research facility here. We teach both master's and PhD students, and we do research in many different areas, including energy, technology development, uh, light and health, human factors, and of course, outdoor lighting, which is what we'll be talking about today. Uh, just to go outline for the, the presentation uh, this morning, uh, first we're going to talk about uh, what are LEDs and what are some advantages of this technology. I think uh, uh, what's interesting to us is before LEDs existed, most people didn't know what light sources were. They couldn't tell you what a high pressure sodium lamp was or what a metal halide lamp was. Um, but with LEDs, people seem uh, interested in this technology and to know more about this. So we're going to just go over it so uh, you all can, can learn more about what the technology is. Um, we'll talk about how LED street lights are categorized. Uh, there are different types of street lighting technologies and we'll talk about that so you'll be more aware when someone uh, tells you about what particular type of, of, of street light they have. Um, we'll talk about wattages. Uh, this is typically how, uh, at least in the U.S., we think about lighting. We don't think so much about light output, lumens, but we think about the wattage of a light bulb. Everyone can understand what a 100 watt incandescent light bulb is, for example. And so um, most of the time we think about replacing wattages. 
Uh, we'll talk about maintenance issues with LEDs, uh, depending on if the utility is going to own the streetlights and maintain them, or if you as a municipality is going to own them. There are things you have to think about in maintaining this technology. Um, and then finally, what questions should you ask? Uh, if you're being approached by a manufacturer or a contractor or even working with a utility, what are some questions that you should ask about this technology uh, so that you know uh, more about it and can make informed decisions? And then, as Brad said, uh, we will have questions at the end. So if you want to know more about LEDs, just uh, type in your question and, and we'll address those uh, at the end. So I'm going to turn this over now to, to Dr. Bullo, and he's going to walk you through LEDs. Okay, thank you, Dan. ...about light-emitting diodes, or LEDs, and what this sort of new, newish technology is, is all about. So LEDs are solid-state devices and interestingly, although the first LEDs uh, were developed at General Electric, um, this technology at first really was only able to produce very small amounts of light. And so really the, the first applications for these in commercial products were things like little tiny indicator lights that you might have on your stereo or your TV, for example. Um, and, and really the, the lighting industry um, didn't do much with these light sources uh, most of the development of LEDs came from the, the semiconductor electronics industry and not the traditional lighting industry. Now LEDs uh, generally will produce uh, what we call a narrow band spectral distribution. So they produce a very limited range of, of wavelengths and that results in a very saturated color appearance typically such as red, yellow, green, or blue. And most white LEDs that we see on the market today are actually blue LEDs uh, with a phosphor um, and a phosphor coating that converts some of the blue light to yellow light. And as a result, that mixture of yellow and blue uh, has a white appearance. There are also color tunable LED sources that do contain uh, red, green, and blue, and sometimes other colors as well um, that you can mix together in different proportions which allow you to create almost any arbitrary color, uh, including white. Uh, but these types of uh, mixed LED sources aren't common for street lighting. Now there are LED lamps or light sources that are available. Typically end users, uh, including municipalities and other consumers, won't purchase individual LED chips or packages. An LED package is a chip mounted onto uh, perhaps a circuit board that might include a lens and also a, a small heat sink, usually a piece of metal that will help dissipate the heat from the LED. So we don't typically buy those like we might buy a light bulb in the hardware store, but typically we'll buy uh, a, a lamp or a lighting system. Now LED lamps are often, like the ones you see in the pictures here, often called light bulbs. Um, and they're available because they fill the, the screw base sockets of some of the conventional uh, types of fixtures, including street lights, um, that would contain what we would consider more traditionally a light. Now, for example, these types of socket-based LED lamps, um, when they're used in, they can be used in some street lights, for example, but they're not necessarily ideal for that application. They can result in significant heat buildup, for example. Um, many streetlights have an enclosed uh, fixture to keep uh, the elements out, and heat from LEDs can build up and really reduce performance. LEDs do not like high temperatures. Um, in addition, and, and probably more critically, uh, generally, a streetlight fixture that was designed to contain, say, a high-pressure sodium lamp or bulb um, has a reflector and perhaps a lens that, that's going to distribute the light from that light source in a particular pattern to, to illuminate the street, for example. Once you put a light source with a different shape where the light elements themselves aren't in the same locations or in the same uh, pattern as the original light source, that fixture is not going to necessarily produce uh, anything close to the same distribution of light uh, that it would have had when it had the original source that it was intended for.
Now the rated life of LEDs can range typically from uh, values up from up to 30,000 hours to more than 85,000 or even 100,000 hours. And assuming a street lighting schedule averaging 12 hours a night of operation throughout the year, this would correspond to between 7 and 20 years of operation. Now unlike many conventional light sources, um, LEDs do not typically uh, burn out. Um, they don't just uh, generally suddenly just uh, you know, turn off at one point in time and, and stop working. Um, like conventional sources, all light sources tend to reduce their light output slowly over time. This is a phenomenon called lumen depreciation. All light sources, whether they're incandescent, fluorescent, sodium, uh, any other type of light source that you might use for any lighting application will all undergo lumen depreciation. Uh, but generally at some point those conventional light sources will reach a point where they simply stop operating and it's very obvious that they're, they're not working anymore. LEDs, for the most part, when they're properly uh, designed, will exhibit this gradual slow reduction in output, um, but they won't necessarily fail uh, immediately, and so it becomes a question of what, when is that light source no longer working properly, providing enough light for an application. For many applications, uh, it's a considered um, a reduction to about 70% of its initial light output is considered the end of useful life. Now lumen depreciation for LEDs and hence its useful life can um, depend on the temperature. I mentioned higher temperatures are things that LED systems uh, do not work well with. And the higher the temperature, the more likely it is and the quick, more quickly the light output from an LED system will reduce. Um, the system will grow dimmer more quickly. Now, although the lighting industry in recent years has focused a lot of its energy uh, on understanding the life uh, characteristics of LEDs, of course, a streetlight fixture also contains uh, other components. It contains what's called a driver. Uh, this is similar to what you would call a ballast in a traditional streetlight. This is the part that provides the electronic uh, uh, current and voltage and, and levels that the, the LED source needs to operate properly from the line voltage that you get from the utility. There are also optics, things like lenses and reflectors and mechanical components that also can have limited life. And putting all these together uh, means at least at this point in time the technology is moving so in such a way that it's difficult to pinpoint um, a street light, an LED street light's useful life. Now white phosphor converted LEDs are available in a range of correlated color temperatures or CCTs that generally describe how warm or yellowish versus how cool or bluish that white light may be. Um, in this diagram you see uh, some spectral curves that show for different wavelengths how much energy uh, light sources of different CCT will produce at those wavelengths. And you can see uh, the, the relative height between the blue LED spectral output, which is sort of the taller, narrower spikes on the left part of that slide, versus the broader uh, humps on the right part of that slide, the relative height between those two curves will determine how bluish or how yellowish, how warm or how cool that light source may appear. The temperature part of correlated color temperature refers to actually to the temperature in kelvins of a material like tungsten that radiates light when it's heated to a particular temperature and that temperature is what we refer to for the CCT. A CCT of 2700K is a warm white light similar to an incandescent lamp. A CCT of say 5000K would be a, a cool white lamp. Now a sodium street light, which is on many of our roads, has a yellowish appearance with a, a lower CCT of around 2100 Kelvin. And older mercury vapor lamps that are still on some of our streets have CCTs around 4000 to 5000 Kelvin for comparison. Both sodium and mercury lamps uh, also have quite limited color rendering ability and that's because they have pretty narrow spectra in specific parts of the spectrum. 
and that means certain colors may not look natural or certain colors may not be easy to tell apart under those lamps. These two photos just kind of give you a sense of what typical sodium and LED illumination might look like on the street. In general, LEDs will have better color rendering properties than both sodium and mercury lamps. Now, one of the big selling points with LEDs in particular has been their energy efficiency. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about that, uh, and we continue to hear a lot about that. This is defined by a term we call luminous efficacy. And essentially, this is the amount of light that a light source produces for a given amount of electrical power. And it has units of lumens per watt. So the luminous efficacy of LEDs, uh, as you can see on this chart, which has years along the x-axis, the horizontal axis, uh, the luminous efficacy of LEDs have really increased dramatically over these past couple decades. Uh, and they have overtaken just about all other uh, street lighting and, and, in fact, many conventional light sources for just about any application based on, on their luminous efficacy performance. Um, in addition, there has uh, often been um, a pretty, pretty large gap in efficacy between uh, the warm and the cool white LED sources using phosphor conversion. Um, typically those with the higher correlated color temperatures, the higher CCTs, the, the more bluish or cooler sources have had higher efficacy. Uh, however, it's important to realize also that that gap is shrinking um, and in some products actually seems to have gone away and is projected to disappear for just about all white phosphor uh, converted LEDs within a few years. Um, what, you, what you'll also notice on this chart, which is kind of interesting, uh, more for the future perhaps, is that color mixed LEDs, which currently are relatively low in their efficacy, are actually projected to be more efficient than the phosphor coated LEDs that are common today uh, for white light. So this is a, a type of technology we might see more in the intermediate to far future for, for all kinds of lighting, including street lighting perhaps. Now, individual LED chips or packages uh, might produce um, hundreds of lumens, uh, one to a few hundred lumens of light output. Um, but street lights that we use on our streets will typically produce thousands or tens of thousands of lumens. Um, so that means LED street lights have to have uh, multiple LED uh, chips within them. Uh, these arrays of LEDs um, can each have you know, reflectors or lenses um, that would distribute the light to create the pattern, uh, the distribution that the street light would produce on the road. And because of the, the higher efficacy of LEDs compared to sodium lights, um, this means that LED street lights can often be spaced farther apart than sodium lights while still producing an adequate distribution of light on the street without dark areas between fixtures, for example. Now, that benefit, in some cases, doesn't necessarily apply to retrofit situations um, because, obviously, in, in those situations, the street light locations uh, are largely determined by the previous lighting system that was there. Uh, and so it may not always be possible to take uh, that aspect of the higher efficacy of LED street lights. Um, in addition, uh, one thing that, that is important as well to consider is that many LED streetlights also have uh, drivers that allow those uh, streetlights to be dimmed, to reduce their output. Um, and that makes them practical for uh, things like adaptive lighting strategies, where light levels might be reduced at very late hours of the night in certain situations. And we'll be talking more about that strategy in, in our upcoming, one of our upcoming webinars. Now, this table here lists several common and other not so common uh, light sources that might, you know, be, have been used in recent years for uh, street lighting applications. And it shows uh, essentially that LEDs, you know, do have the performance characteristics that are needed to make them not only feasible, but in, in many cases uh, desirable for street lighting in terms of things like life of the system, luminous efficacy, the range of available color, uh, color temperatures, and the ability to render uh, colored objects naturally. 
that CRI column refers to color rendering index, which is some indication of how natural colors might appear under a particular light source. Uh, I'm not going to walk through every value in this table, but it's here so that you can refer to it when the slides are posted online on NYSERDA's Clean Energy Communities website. So now we'll move on uh, from the light source or the LED technology specifically to a discussion of uh, the actual fixtures themselves, the street light. So street light luminaires are most commonly categorized by the type of distribution of light, how the light is uh, oriented in terms of where the light is going and, and uh, where it ends up on, hopefully on the street. Um, and so these different distributions uh, define some of the categories. And one common classification is called the lateral distribution type. And this type system uses, generally uses Roman numerals to indicate uh, at a very rough uh, indication of how much light the street light might distribute across the street, for example. So for a narrow two-lane road that didn't have any sidewalks, uh, a type 1 street light uh, might very well be adequate because you want to simply illuminate the street and try to put these uh, street lights uh, as far apart as you can and just light that narrow strip of, of asphalt. Um, as you get into streets with more lanes and also when you want to make sure the street light illuminates adjacent sidewalks, um, higher type numbers in general will be more likely to spread the illumination not only along the street but across it as well. Now for area lighting applications like parking lots, for example, um, you'll often see the, the higher type numbers used specifically for those applications, especially, for example, the type 5 or the type uh, 5S or Q, which refers to a square, squarish kind of pattern or rectangular pattern. Uh, in that case, the luminaire may be in the middle of a parking lot, for example, and there's no need to really only throw light forward like you would for a street light on the side of the street. Um, so for street lighting, however, you're most likely going to be dealing with types uh, one, two, or perhaps three uh, fixtures, and the higher types tend to be more used for area lighting. Um, but if you have a very, very wide road, uh, you'll tend to use the higher uh, lateral distribution types. So that lateral distribution type describes sort of an aspect of how useful uh, a street light might be. But there's another type of classification that's uh, about sort of the potential negative consequences of, of street lighting, such as light pollution. Uh, and this system, developed by the Illuminating Engineering Society, or the IES, is called the BUG, or B-U-G, rating system. It gives you a sense of how much light uh, a street light might put into locations that aren't necessarily beneficial for the end user. So the B in that system stands for backlight, which this could be light that would spill onto adjacent properties uh, next to the street and might be perceived as light trespass. Now in some cases, backlight may not always be a bad thing, especially in, for example, in a parking lot when you have a fixture in the middle of a parking lot, uh, the light in both the forward and back light zones would obviously be useful. In the bug system stands for uplight, uh, and that's light that would be going up generally into the sky and creating sky glow, obviously something we don't need to do and should try to avoid. The G in bug stands for glare, and that refers to that high angle light um, close to the horizontal direction uh, that can make a street light glary when you're looking at it from, from a distance. Now each of those bug zones, the BUG zones, are sort of shown in the diagram around that street light. You can also see what would be considered the useful, the most useful illumination for street lighting, that area uh, noted by forward light. Now, of course, uh, luminaires can also be classified by their appearance, and in many ways that's the most obvious way that we are able to classify these just by the way that they look. Uh, and appearance is often important to, to many municipalities. Um, so the typical functional type of street lights that we use most commonly are called cobra heads. And you can see a picture of a cobra head on the, on the photo on the top. 
it kind of has that sort of appearance of a you know a cobra with its uh, you know with its opening head opening uh, open there kind of gives you that appearance and that's where it gets its name. Now older cobra heads like the one in this photo uh, often have what's called a drop lens that sort of uh, lens that's uh, dropping down fr from the opening of the the cobra head. But just about all um, newer cobra heads now have a flat lens in place of that drop lens. And that, of course, helps reduce uh, up light from the fixture and, uh, you know, light pollution. Now, many LED streetlights will also have a, a vaguely cobra head-like shape. Um, and so these fixtures are t often tend to be mounted 20, 30, or even 40 or more feet above the ground. Um, that means these types of fixtures generally aren't directly in our field of view as we're driving or walking along the street. Uh, we often don't even notice them. Um, another type of luminaire that tends to be more decorative are post-top luminaires. Um, and these will often, as I mentioned, have a decorative appearance. You might find lantern uh, types of shapes or acorn shapes. Often uh, these are inspired by a historic appearance and these are, for that reason, they tend to be more common in some downtown areas uh, and other areas where the appearance of the fixture itself is more important, even its appearance during the daytime when the fixture isn't on. These types of post-top luminaires are usually mounted on lower pole heights, uh, often 10 to 20 feet above the ground. And that means they tend to be more visible. Uh, that lower height also makes glare more critical for these types of fixtures because they're obviously going to be more likely to be in our field of view. Um, so it's important to be sure uh, to understand how the uh, distribution of light uh, at those higher angles can affect pedestrians and drivers. So one very common question that many municipalities have when considering switching to LED street lighting is about the wattages. What is the, what's the right wattage that should replace, you know, usually it will be replacing sodium street lights. Sodium lights come in a very uh, few specific wattages. You have generally 70, 100, 150, 250, or 400 watts. Uh, LED street lights differ because they have, uh, each manufacturer has a very wide range of specific wattages, and so it's very hard to to, to get a sense of what's standard. There really aren't any standard wattages. Now, another complication about selecting LED streetlight wattages, of course, uh, for, for retrofit lighting especially, is that LEDs, uh, as, we as we mentioned, have been and are still continuing to be a moving target. In other words, the, get, the amount of light that a given LED streetlight of a certain wattage might produce uh, in one year is not going to be the same as it is in a, in a future year. So what that means, um, we're very much still on the rising portion of this graph where, where efficacies of LED systems are increasing. And that means that even if we know the correct wattage for a particular LED streetlight in 2019, um, that may not necessarily be the correct one on future generations of projects, products from even 2021 or, or later. And so for this reason, um, it may be more helpful, and Dan mentioned this, is think of equivalence not in terms of wattage, but really in terms of, of light output or lumen output. And as one example, um, some electric utilities have you know, various suggestions for the typical lumen packages, the number of lumens that a streetlight you know, might produce that a municipality might consider uh, when replacing high pressure sodium or HPS streetlights. One utility here in New York State uses uh, the following types of guidelines. Um, so a 70 or 100 watt uh, sodium streetlight would be replaced, for example, by an LED light that produced between two and 4,000 lumens. A 150 watt sodium would be replaced by a LED streetlight that produced Four to 8,000 lumens, a 250 watt by a LED with 8 to 14,000 lumens, and the 400 watt sodium by a 20 to 30,000 uh, lumen LED streetlight. Um, and so you can see for the listed wattages uh, for at least what's 
uh, available today for those particular uh, lumen ranges, that can result in pretty substantial energy reductions compared to sodium streetlights. Um, there are, however, a couple things to keep in mind uh, regarding this type of equivalency when you see comparisons like the ones I just showed you. Now, just based on lumens, uh, it may be possible that after switching to LED streetlights using those types of equivalencies, that you could still have, uh, after the switch, lower light levels along the street. Uh, we've done a number of analyses for a few different uh, street types with these types of equivalent uh, you know, recommendations and found that those light levels could be, in some cases, 15 to 20% lower than you would have had uh, or had with the high pressure sodium street lighting. And depending upon the, the specific distribution, especially the lateral distribution of those LED street lights, that could result in even lower light levels along the sidewalks compared to the street. So it all depends on the specific LED light that's used. So in some cases, it's very difficult to generalize. Having said that, one of the things that might help offset the reduction in light levels is that people judge uh, streets lighted by white light sources, such as LEDs, uh, as being brighter than those that are lighted by these yellowish light sources, um, such as high pressure sodium. And so people may not necessarily judge this, re you know, even if there is a reduction, people may not necessarily judge that reduction as uh, a reduction in the brightness. Um, and this picture on the, on the right shows uh, a street that was lighted by 100 watt high pressure sodium lamps uh, and then was retrofitted with 55 watt uh, white light sources with a lower uh, average illuminance and yet people still tended to judge uh, the, the conditions under the white light source, even though they had lower measured light levels as being uh, brighter uh, in terms of the appearance, even though, again, the light level itself was lower. Now, it's important to recognize that, you know, though the practice of using lower light levels um, with a white light source like LEDs will increase brightness perception, uh, this is not something that's yet recognized in recommendations like the Illuminating Engineering, Engineering Society's practices for roadway lighting. So at this point, I will turn things back over to Dan, and he's going to discuss some considerations for LED street lighting maintenance. Hi again, everybody. So uh, one of the benefits that people talk about when they talk about LEDs is uh, the, the maintenance issues. As John said at the beginning, if these light sources can last between uh, a low of 35 and a high of even 100,000 hours, then you're going to be changing them out less often. So um, one of the things you really have to be careful with with LED uh, street lighting is that when uh, are you going to replace it? So uh, as John said, LEDs tend not to burn out or have what we call catastrophic failure. You know, like you, you walk out on your street now, there's a high pressure sodium street light out there, the street light just doesn't work and it's, you know, it's out and we know that that has to be replaced. With LEDs, uh, with many of them, some of them will burn out that same way. But for the most part, they will just depreciate over time. And so uh, one of the things that both a utility, if they're in charge of maintenance, or a municipality needs to think about is they need to know when were those installed um, <clears throat> based upon their usage, let's say an average of 12 hours a night, if they are supposed to last a certain number of thousand hours, um, we need to think about when in the future are we going to replace those. Now, many LEDs uh, do come with warranty periods so that uh, a manufacturer will say, okay, I warranty this fixture for five years, or some may have as many as 10 years. Um, but what you have to be careful with is you have to read the warranty carefully. Um, many things may not be covered under that warranty. So you have to make sure you know what that warranty covers and if in fact there is a failure or the, the, the lights 
become dim much more quickly, what uh, is that manufacturer going to do uh, to you, uh, for you, uh, over these particular periods of time? Um, and as John said, failure mechanisms differ. Um, and you also have to consider that there's not only LEDs in this light source. So when they can figure out a life of a fixture, they base it upon the lumen depreciation of the LEDs. You can see the graph at the right. When it gets to 70% of its initial light output, that's what they call um, the end of life. But there are other components in that fixture most notably electronic components like the driver, which may actually fail more quickly than 100,000 hours. So you may be, uh, have a fixture that no longer operates, and it's not that the LEDs aren't operating, but that this driver needs to be replaced. So is the manufacturer going to cover that, and is this a component that's easily replaceable? Can you get into that fixture? Can you replace that driver? Will drivers be available in the future to be able to replace that? So you have to consider all of those things um, when thinking about when you're going to replace this. Um, and one thing to note is we tend not to replace things that don't break. So a concern might be that if fixtures stay in place 10, 15 years, and they're still producing some light output, um, will people actually replace them? You have to think about the fact that, that even though they may still be operating, their light output is not providing the amount of light that you need. Um, <clears throat> so uh, with traditional light sources like high pressure sodium, metal halide, or other light sources that are used in street lighting, Typically, when there's a failure, you go in, you replace the light bulb, you clean the fixture, um, everything's great. It goes back to you know, the light output that it had over time. But unlike conventional street lights, most LED uh, street lights have what we call an integral light source. So that LED is actually built in to that fixture. So it's not that you're going to pop out the LED and replace it or pop out that module and replace it. Um, you typically are going to replace the entire luminaire. Now, more and more, uh, we do see that some street lights do have replaceable LED modules so that you can take out the part of the fixture that is the LEDs and you can put, replace it with another one. Um, and usually the driver is also replaceable because although the LED may, may have a warranty for 10 years, that driver may only last four or five years, depending, again, on the heat and, and other issues that, that might um, be going on in that particular luminaire. So when you're looking at particular fixtures and, and you're going to be the entity that's maintaining those, you have to understand, is the LED module replaceable? Will that module be available in the future? Uh, is the driver replaceable? Will I be able to get that same driver to replace it in that fixture? Um, or is it something that you decide that, okay, I'm going to pay this for the luminaire, and when it no longer operates or its light output is no longer satisfactory, I'm going to replace the entire luminaire. So when you're thinking about your maintenance cost and making decisions, you have to, to know uh, what it is you're going to have to replace. Um, so if the street lighting is not owned by the utility, the municipality has to perform the maintenance, or you can contract or hire someone to do it. There are companies that will provide maintenance services um, to municipalities, or they, they do the same thing for people who have parking lots. Uh, if you're a local Walmart, uh, there's probably a Walmart doesn't change the the uh, lighting in their parking lot, they hire a maintenance contractor to do that. So you can do that. Uh, or if you're going to do it yourself, you have to make sure you have the necessary equipment, like a lift truck um, uh, as well. And the other thing you have to consider is um, trees. Uh, these need to be trimmed over time. We have seen some installations where uh, the light fixture is so covered by tree limbs that it's not lighting the street at all. Um, people, uh, when they're replacing street light poles, they often plant trees. Uh, people generally do not consider that trees grow. 
uh, and will grow into the street light. So another thing about maintenance is that someone needs to be responsible for trimming back the trees as well. So let's talk about some questions uh, that you should ask when you're considering uh, what type of street lights that you're going to buy. Um, first of all, will the municipality or the electric utility own the street lights? Uh, we're going to talk about this more uh, in the next uh, webinar that we'll do in next month, uh, so we'll touch on that issue. Uh, but for utility-owned street lights, overall the savings are not going to be as great as if you own them yourselves because the utility has to figure into that tariff the installation costs, the maintenance costs, the energy costs um, over time. And they depreciate that light fixture over a period of 10 or 15 years. Those depreciation costs are figured in that. And so when they have a particular tariff that's been approved, to them, approved for them, all of those costs are included. So you may not see a large savings in your utility bill uh, if you're going with that option. Uh, the second option is if you own them yourself, you are going to see an immediate reduction in your energy bill because you're no longer paying that tariff, um, you're only paying for the energy that is used by those street lights, and it generally will be significantly less, at least half, of what uh, you were previously paying. But you are then responsible for the maintenance uh, of those particular street lights. So again, we'll talk about this more but this is something that you need to think about um, when you're making your decision. Um, <clears throat> what LED options are available? Um, most utilities have a very limited selection of LED light fixtures, luminaires. They typically have uh, four to six uh, lumen packages, wattages that they're available, one or two correlated color temperature options. You can choose from a 3,000 Kelvin or a 4,000 Kelvin for a particular, for example, a particular um, fixture. If you're a municipality that's going to own them yourself, you have typically a wider option of luminaires that are available to you. And New York State, uh, through NIPA, for example, might have um, purchasing contracts that they have and they've negotiated prices with LED manufacturers, but, and you typically have a choice from five, six, seven, even eight different manufacturers and different lumen packages so that you can look at uh, the different distributions of fixtures, the appearance of the fixtures, the light output of the fixtures, and more closely match those to what you actually need on that street rather than saying, okay, we're going to take this one out and we're going to replace it with this lumen package because, well, that's what the utility has available. Um, and again, you also have to think about that warranty. Warranties are so important. Um, because LEDs are a new technology, and as John said, they're evolving over time, and they are sensitive to things like heat, um, you have to be, uh, really understand what is the warranty, what does that cover um, if you're going to own these yourself. Um, <clears throat> what light levels will there be? For retrofit situations, you have to think about the light level and the uniformity. So, you know, uh, when you think about light level, it's an average over the street. So they say, okay, on average you have, you know, two foot candles on your street or 20 lux on your street, let's say. Well, that average doesn't mean much because you could have a lot of light directly under the fixture, as happens with many conventional technologies, and yet you have dark areas in between. So uniformity is as important, if not sometimes more important, than the overall light level. So when you're looking at fixtures, you have to understand what is the light level going to be, but also what is the uniformity of that over the particular street or roadway. Um, <clears throat> what are the um, assumptions that people are using? If you are going to a manufacturer and they're going to say, well, you're going to have this light level on your street. Um, what are the assumptions that they've built into that? So when you're thinking about that, you have to say, okay, well, is that the light level I'm going to have the first day that these street lights go in? Or is that the light level I'm going to have after they depreciate to 10,000 hours or 20,000 hours or 30,000 hours? Um, typically what you want to do is you want to look at what the light levels will be in the future um, because dirt is going to uh, 
uh, build up on that light fixture, uh, that dirt is going to depreciate the light output of that fixture, the lumen depreciation over time. So you have to understand what the assumptions are uh, that that manufacturer is using or contractor is using when they say, okay, this is the street light um, that you want. Uh, are these lighting conditions going to meet municipal standards? Do you have particular standards in your area that uh, you have to have a particular amount of light on a street? Um, is this going to meet those particular standards or recommendations? Um, John had mentioned the Illuminating Engineering Society has recommendations for different types of streets, different types of roadways, and how much light they should have on them. Um, you should know if you're doing the replacement, is this going to meet those recommendations? Generally, with utility mounted, utility pole mounted um, light fixtures, they almost never meet the recommendations of the IEF. Um, but you want to know that the light you're putting in is either as good or better than, from the standpoint of light levels and uniformity, than what you're taking out. Um, and then also, will the luminaires illuminate the sidewalk or other off-street areas? You know, you have an existing light source there, a high-pressure sodium light source, that tends to uh, spread light in all directions, where LEDs can be very directional and they can be very well controlled to keep the light on the roadway. And that's great, uh, especially if you have homes that are relatively close to that roadway. People don't want the light to come onto their property and into their windows. Um, but if you counted on that light fixture to also light the adjacent sidewalk that was perhaps behind the pole and your um, fixture is giving you no backlight, maybe you're not going to get the light on that sidewalk that you had. So these are all things you need to think about uh, when you're deciding um, either with the utility or with um, a contractor if you're owning these streetlights yourself, uh, things you need to think about. Uh, when selecting those fixtures. Um, what areas will be lighted? Um, LED street lights uh, efficiently illuminate the road surface, but maybe they don't light sidewalks, maybe they don't light driveways, other um, off-street locations. You need to see if that's figured into the analysis uh, when you're choosing uh, LEDs. Um, there are a number of tools, uh, software tools. You can see a, uh, a, a rendering uh, from a particular software tool. This is a, uh, a it looks like a one, two, three, four, five lane road. Uh, and you can see where the luminaires are in this particular. You can see there uh, is a light fixture, uh, two light fixtures on the left hand side, one on the right, and you can see the distribution from that fixture, and all of these little numbers are uh, light levels. So this is probably in lux, and you can see how much light is on the roadway at particular areas. So there are a number of these software tools, some that, that are uh, free online, and you could actually use them yourself if you uh, wanted to do that. You could learn how to use it. Um, but typically, a contractor or a utility is going to do this type of analysis for you. Um, and what you have to understand is that, um, that we, we put uh, on the slide here garbage in, garbage out. If people don't understand how to use these or aren't using the correct assumptions, depreciating the, depreciating the light output, for example, uh, rather than using the light output, um, you're not going to get a, a good uh, a, a actual rendering of what the light levels will be. So again, you should understand what tool is there are they using, what are the assumptions that they're using in that tool, so that you can um, analyze uh, what you're actually going to get over time. So um, as we said, we have, uh, Brad mentioned this at the beginning, we have two more uh, webinars that we're doing. Uh, November 12th is talking about planning for success with LED street lighting. So this will talk more about uh, the layout of LED street lighting, the design of them, uh, the anticipated costs and savings uh, with particular LED street lighting. Uh, we will also have a representative from the New York Power Authority uh, that will be speaking on uh, that uh, webinar as well and talking more about making the choice between utility-owned and municipal-owned street lighting. 
Uh, and then our last webinar is in December. Um, and this talks about more the impacts on people. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about color characteristics, uh, but we'll talk about that more uh, then. Um, we'll talk about uh, the impacts on people, on light at night, light pollution, those type of things. And then we'll also talk about the benefits of adapted control strategies. John mentioned that um, uh, one nice thing about LEDs is that they are dimmable. They can be controlled over time. And so uh, can you take advantage of that for both energy savings, um, but as well as if you have a neighborhood street, people like it to be dark at night. Um, would it be nice to be able to dim that after a particular hour when that street is rarely used um, uh, at, at late at night? <clears throat> um, also, another service available from the Lighting Research Center through this program is technical assistance. Uh, we are helping a number of municipalities throughout New York State right now, uh, helping them make decisions about uh, the replacement of their street lights. Uh, whether it's utility owned or a municipal owned, uh, we can help you go through that, uh, assist with product selection. We can do technical analysis uh, like that software that I showed a, a couple of slides ago. We can do that and let you know how much light you're going to get, what the uniformity is, um, and we can also uh, help you with evaluation of existing lighting, um, have someone come take measurements of what the existing lighting is, um, so that you can uh, better choose replacements for that. And um, you can get that information through the, the Clean Energy Program. So that's it. I'm going to turn it back over to Brad. Um, and if anyone's typed in any questions, he's going to facilitate that for us. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, Great presentation. We're going to take a few questions now from the Q&A box. Uh, many communities are very concerned about overlighting. Can you explain the bug rating and maybe talk a little bit about uplight or dark sky rated lighting just to give us a little sense? I know we're going to cover that in uh, future webinars. Sure. Well, the, the bug rating is really not, not necessarily dealing specifically with overlighting in a sense that sometimes you find areas just have much more light than, than you would normally have for, for a recommendation for a different certain type of street. So the bug ratings are specifically dealing with light that would go in the directions where it's not really serving a useful purpose, uh, whether that's up into the sky, uh, whether that's uh, at the high angles or behind the fixture in certain cases. And so there are uh, sort of limits that um, the IES would recommend for certain types of areas. If you have a rural town versus a, an urban area, um, they have some quantitative limits on what a fixture might, you know, might be allowed to produce in those in those areas. Overlighting in general is is when you have more light than say a, the recommendation would suggest is an appropriate light level, and that's something that um, you know you want to avoid simply because you might just be putting more light. Uh, in a space than you really need for safety or for making people feel safe. And what is IES? IES is the Illuminating Engineering Society. Uh, and so it's a North American uh, standards making organization. They develop recommendations, consensus based recommendations for many different lighting applications, including streets and, and roads. And so they developed some recommendations for how much light and how uniform that light might be on a street. If you have a local street in a, in a residential area versus all the way up to a, a freeway. Um, so they have different recommendations that uh, can be met. Um, the IES recommendations you can, are available through, uh, through IES.org. You can get a lot more information about those. Great. And then uh, you mentioned there are free tools on, online. Could, could you just tell us, uh, maybe share some of the most reliable free tools that are available? Um, the one that's probably uh, most common is it's, it's called Visual 3D. Uh, and it's actually made by a particular lighting manufacturer, Acuity Lighting. Um, it allows you to use uh, any manufacturer's uh, photometric files. So people who make uh, light fixtures will produce uh, a, an electronic file that you can input into these lighting calculation uh, programs 
that will allow you to do those calculations. Um, and so that's the one that's probably easiest to access uh, and uh, use. Um, even though it was made by a particular manufacturer, it allows you to input files from any, any manufacturer. Um, so it's a pretty convenient tool for that purpose. With regard uh, to heat and the drivers, are the drivers impacted by external temperature? They can be. Um, what's interesting is that there are many different uh, designs uh, or circuit, you know, circuit topologies for, for drivers. So it really depends on exactly what components you have in those drivers. Um, obviously some are going to be more sensitive to temperature variations um, or higher temperatures. Uh, so it really depends on the specific driver. It's, it's not possible to, to say in general that they're going to perform better in the cold or better in the heat. Um, some of them are very sensitive to, to large rapid swings in temperature, for example, as well. So it, it depends on exactly how that, how that driving circuit is put together. So some, sometimes you see LED fixtures that appear to have a small number of diodes uh, while others have dozens of diodes. Does the number of diodes affect things like efficacy, glare, or light quality? It, it can, um, and again, it, it really depends on what, we have a little bit of an ambulance going by, um, it depends on what type of uh, lens as well. Um, typically when you see uh, what looks like um, a larger, uh, almost like a larger single LED that might have, you know, an inch diameter, um, that's what you're seeing in the, is a yellow, sort of a yellowish circle that might actually be a phosphor plate behind which there might be a dozen or more individual LED chips. Um, so it's, it's really, uh, in some sense, difficult to predict exactly what you're getting because um, there's so many different possible configurations. Now there was a question about what role uh, NYSERDA plays in the conversion process compared to NIPA's role. I think what would be best is uh, if you go onto NYSERDA's website, uh, to the, you could probably just search NYSERDA LED uh, Streetlight Toolkit, and there's a link there to NIPA's program with respect to LED street lighting conversion. It's part of the Smart Streetlight New York program. They're going to be on our next webinar, and they're going to really have a better opportunity to describe their services. Uh, but NYSERDA's role is really uh, to provide information to communities so they can make their own decisions about the, the uh, types of products they might want to select as well as the kind of different implementation pathways they might consider. And that would differ depending on if it's a utility-owned conversion uh, or if it's a municipally-owned conversion. Uh, but that being said, we're at the end of the time, so I just wanted to encourage you all, if you want to learn more, please visit NYSERDA's website www.nyserta.ny.gov slash CEC, and you can see the LED street lighting toolkit and a bunch of other tools and resources. I want to thank our guests at uh, the LRC. Uh, thank you all for attending, uh, and we'll catch you uh, next month on the next LED street lighting cabinet webinar. Thank you very much.